Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. First of all, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, it's wonderful when so many, especially from your hometown, show up. I'm a Baltimorean by birth and uh, raising and so on. Outside of seven years, I've lived my whole life in this area. But I am glad that you're here, and especially for this occasion, because this really is a new piece of material. But tonight, as you know, is the 13th day of November. And within a heartbeat, Christmas will be with us. And I'd just like to tell you a very, very uh, heartwarming, uh, wonderful Christmas tale about a little 10-year-old boy who wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And he started in July working on his mother and dad. I'd love to have that bike. And when it got around to the first week of December, he thought he'd get a little help. And after school one afternoon, he went up to his room, and he took out some writing paper, a little pad, on his desk, and he thought he'd write to Santa Claus, and then it hit him. Why not go above Santa? He'd write a letter to God. And he did. He said, Dear God, if you help me get that bicycle, I will be good for a whole year. Well, he looked at it. He knew he couldn't be good for a year, and he crumpled that one. <laughs> Dear God, if I get the bike, I'll be good for six months. Not that one. <laughs> and he kept bringing it down, bringing it down. Finally, he got to one week. I will be good for a whole week. And he looked at it, and he knew he couldn't play with God. He knew God knew him better than he did. And he knew that he had trouble being good for a whole day. And he crumpled it and threw it away. And he was just perplexed, didn't know what to do, when his eye struck the statue of our Blessed Mother on his dresser. And he just lit up. He got a towel and wrapped the statue in the towel, put it in a shoe box, put it in the farthest corner in his closet, covered it with three or four blankets, and with a triumphant look on his face, went back to his desk and wrote, Dear God, if you ever want to see your mother again, <laughs> there are some wonderful, of course, stories about heaven and so on. Uh, the latest one I heard is these three fellows got to the gate, and they made it. They were to go in, and our Lord said to them, well, before we enter eternity, is there anything I can do for you? And the first one said, the arthritis in this left shoulder is about killing me. Put his hand on it, it was cured. And another one said, my knees are so bad I can hardly walk. He put his hand on them, and they were cured. The third one said, don't touch me, I'm on disability. <laughs> Forget the miracles. It wasn't uh, too long ago when uh, Pat got a request from a lady in Georgia for me to come down and give a talk at some gathering there. And she gave the title of the talk that she wanted me to give, Recovery and Forgiveness. Well, I didn't have anything as such on that, and I had to work on it. But it was then that they decided at home that perhaps it would be a good idea to develop a piece on that and do something with it. And I've done it twice, once down there in Georgia and once to our own community at Ashley. And I, I am pleased to say and blessed to know that it is helpful. It's very helpful to troubled, addicted people. Recovery and forgiveness. Now let's go back pretty much to the beginning. You know that in the uh, account of creation, after the various phases of creation, God looked at what he had done and saw that it was good. And he made us good. Human beings by nature are good. Something happened along the way and we became very damaged. And by the way, it was not the apple in the tree that caused the mess. It was that pear on the ground. <laughs> by the way, one day in paradise, Eve looked at Adam and said, Adam, do you love me? He said, who else? 
Well. <laughs> the damage is this, and we've heard the words before, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. St. Paul once said, the things that I would do, I fail to do. The things that I would not do, those are the ones that I do. And that's pretty much characteristic of our human nature. We are simply weak, and we tend towards that which is not good. Um, I, I'm not here this evening as a Catholic priest. Everything that I say will be based on what I've learned from the 12 principles of AA and how they should govern our behavior. As a changeover from what the behavior was before. I believe that you all have heard the word ethics. You usually take ethics courses in college. Ethics is natural morality. It is the human mind arriving through reason without divine revelation, without religions entering into it, telling us anything. Ethics is natural morality based on thought. And it is one single principle. Good is to be done. Evil is to be avoided. And that's a basic. Now, what is good and what is evil, people have different ideas about. But what we're interested in is that basic principle, you do good and avoid evil. And men, mankind, from the beginning, have functioned according to that principle. That when you do good, you are pleased and happy and fulfilled. And when you do the opposite, it gives birth to unhappiness and misery. Now, we in this Western world are far from a Judeo-Christian ethic that accepts the Ten Commandments, which are wrapped up in the single phrase, you know, the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. AA teaches, live and let live. <coughs> God reserves three rights for himself out of the ten, and he gives mankind seven. Now, it's up to us to respect those rights. You have a right to your life. You have a right to your own body. You have a right to your property. You have a right to your good name. <clears throat> when I break any of those things, that's what we call sin, or in the world of justice, crime. And we do that all the time. Now, good is to be done, evil is to be avoided, and I want to do the good, and very often I don't, I fail. Very often I want to avoid the things I should avoid, and I run right to them. Now let's, this is ordinary people. Ordinary people, good people find that it is hard to be good. Now let's enter the world of addiction. You know as well as I do, it's very difficult to be good even when it's easy. You're going along, let's say you've just made a retreat and somebody makes a nasty remark and everything in here wells up, you want to punch them out. It's the way we go in here. The human soul just leans toward those things of license rather than true freedom. We want to do what we want to do. Um, drug your conscience and see where your behavior goes. If it's hard to be good when we are in command of ourselves, try being good when you drug your conscience. I've tried this in treatment centers with patients. And I always tell them, please don't put your hands up. But be honest enough to answer this question inside of your own soul. Have you ever, in your life, ever, deliberately taken a couple of drinks or a drug 
in order to be able to do something that you know you couldn't do sober. Live that way for a while and see where you wind up. The result of all wrongdoing, whether it's a positive act that does something that is forbidden, or a negative act of not doing something that I know I'm supposed to do. It results in a phenomenon that we call guilt, and we would be lost without it. Don't ever let anyone, so-called professional or not, try to talk you out of guilt. If we did not feel guilt over some of the rules we break, then the sky is the limit we'd all be living like pigs. Guilt is based on the terrible shame and embarrassment that I feel when I know I have broken the rules that we are all supposed to keep. Now, I know this sounds like a first grade class, but I mean, it's not only essential, but we all know this. I'm just reminding you of it. We all feel guilty about the bad things we do. We should. The shame and the embarrassment. And it begins to build up and build up and build up, especially in addictive people whose negative immoral behavior is dictated by their illness. Ladies and gentlemen, Alcoholics Anonymous, I think, is one of the only therapies on earth, if not the only, that dares to acknowledge morality. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of our lives. Wherever you hear the word moral, any form of it, it has to do with the rightness or wrongness of human behavior. <laughs> Compulsive drinking, coupled with living the lie of denial, and the following aberrant behavior has to result in utter misery of soul because we know that we have become separated from God. We're not living the way we know He wants us to live according to these ten rules. And we don't know what to do about it. We hate ourselves and our relationship with others is all shattered. By the way, those ten commandments Moses came off of Mount Sinai one day and he had the two tablets. He said, I want you to gather around. I got some news. I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is I got him down to 10. <laughs> the bad news is adultery is still on the list. We know that when we begin to make up our own rules and our own interpretations of these commands, we get into trouble. And the guilt builds up and builds up. Now we see the wisdom of AA in steps four and five. Why do we make an inventory of our lives? To show us that in spite of the sinfulness of our lives, we're still good. Ladies and gentlemen, I've done some good things, wonderful things in my life, and so have you. Don't deny them. Don't let the guilt overwhelm you, but don't wash it away. The guilt has been earned, and we deserve what we earn. Now what are we going to do about it? The only thing that will dispel guilt is a realization that I have resolved it by being forgiven. And that's what tonight's talk is about, forgiveness. We admit it to God, to ourselves, and one other human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. I cannot live sober with unresolved guilt of my past. It's too horrible. Allow me, please, to say something that may be of help, if there are any of you in this room who honestly feel that you have done things so horrible, 
God will never forgive you. God is not only different from us in degree, but in nature. In God, everything is God. He is love. He is mercy. He is compassion. He is forgiveness. And any human being who honestly believes that he could commit any sin or crime bigger than God can forgive is really guilty of a perverse kind of spiritual arrogance. You're just not that good at being that bad. There is nothing, nothing bigger than God can forgive. Please remember that. And so we approach God to be forgiven the breaking of any of these rules that he gave us to live by. The emphasis is on asking. Ask, and you'll receive. And God is forgiveness. And so sorrow for what I have done is the absolute condition for forgiveness. I must be sorry. What's that mean? Sorrow looks towards the one offended. I am so sorry that what I have done has offended you. And I guess we could say, I really didn't mean to. Ladies and gentlemen, every single thing we do is meant to please ourselves. We don't wake up in the morning and say, how can I offend God today? Give me the list. I think I'll pick out number four. We don't do that. Everything we do, to a greater or lesser degree, we do for self-fulfillment. Read a book, take a nap, eat a meal, go on a vacation, talk to a friend, uh, help the old lady down the street do her shopping. Even difficult things, if they're done for others, we gain a certain fulfillment out of it. Now, many of the things we do to please ourselves, I just named a list of them, perfectly good. Many of the things we do to please ourselves are against some of these rules, perfectly bad. So I don't wake up in the morning in order to offend God. I function in order to please me, but some of the things that I do to please me are against his rules. That's what we call sin. And I go up to God and say, look, I didn't mean to offend you. I meant to please myself, but I broke one of your laws. I am sorry. What does sorry mean? It means I'm going to try as best I can not to do that again. I may do it again, but I don't intend to. And so forgiveness depends on my sorrow for what I have done, and it is guilt. My guilt will prompt me to that. I don't want to feel miserable inside of me. I don't want to feel towards me the way I do. You've heard me say so many times, I believe that one of the greatest gifts that God Almighty can give addicted people is to allow them to look into a mirror and experience an undeniable, overwhelming desire to vomit because you just can't stop what you're looking at. That is a plus. That is a blessing. Because many people can't see the evil that they have done in their image. Trying to justify the way I live, I build up justifying answers when I'm accused. When all of that is stripped away, I find that there is not much in me to be proud of. Apart from the sorrow, I'm sorry, Lord. And he does want to hear those words. I'm sorry. And then there may be a price to pay, some consequence of my behavior. I've always, I remember in one talk, I used the example of a little kid. He was hitting a baseball, and it was a very windy day. And about the third or fourth time he hit the ball to his buddy out in the outfield, the wind caught it and drove it right through a neighbor's window. Well, he didn't intend to do that. But he walked up to her house, rang the doorbell. He said, Mrs. Smith, 
I'm the one who hit that ball. I didn't mean to, and I'm terribly sorry. She says, I forgive you. That will be twelve ninety-five. <laughs> you pay for the glass. You pay the consequences of your behavior. Um, in the days of Wine and Roses, you remember that film, of course. It was, it was absolutely excellent. Jack Lemmon played a young yuppie on his way up. And he and his wife were both alcoholics. And they lost everything. And uh, he had once, his father-in-law was a florist, and he had a hothouse. And Lemon had hidden a half pint of whiskey in a flower pot. And the compulsion to drink the morning after the night before was so great, he forgot which coffee pot he had put, or which uh, flower pot he had put the bottle in, and he went through that hothouse destroying everything in his way to, you know, trying to find that bottle. And he did about $500 of damage. Well, anyway, AA found him and he got sober, and on his way back to a normal life, he had a job as a taxi driver. And he saved something from each week's pay. And when he had the amount to take care of that debt to fix that uh, hothouse, he went up to his father-in-law and he said, uh, I owe you this. And his father-in-law said, I'm not interested in that. You're making your way back. What we need to be interested in is getting my daughter sober. Now, he said, Dad, I understand that. It may not be important for you to accept this check, it is very important for me to give it. And the father accepted it. I remember in the story of an alcoholic priest friend of mine, he used to help out at a parish where after the last mass he would drink an entire water tumbler full of the altar wine. And he figured that before he got sober he must have drunk about a case of it, but it kind of went out of his memory after he went into treatment. He was sober eight years eight years. And uh, they were having a meeting in somebody's home. The poor guy couldn't get out to meetings. He had to be there with his children. His wife was in the hospital. So there was a small group used to bring meetings to his house. And it came up to the making amends step. And it occurred to this priest that he hadn't paid for that wine. So uh, he went down to the rectory. He and the pastor there were good friends by this time. And he had a check for the amount of a case of wine. And he said, uh, John, I, uh, I owe you this. He said, what do you mean you owe it to me? Well, he said, I drank that case of your wine in my drinking days. Well, he said, I'm not interested in that. He said, you may not be, but it's important for me to give it. Give it to the poor, use it whatever way you want. And uh, the, the priest who was pastor of that parish understood completely and accepted the check. It is important not only to be sorry, but to show it, to show it by paying the price. Now, some amends that we make to humans may be rejected, or it may take a long time in order to make them. And if they're very serious, I think that we in order to gain forgiveness, we have to rate, wait till the right time to try to make those amends. And I think that it is terribly important to get the advice of older people in the program who can advise you on proper timing. They may not be able to. You're just going to have to feel your way there. But uh, I know for a fact a man who could get up in front of an AA group and bring the whole group to tears with how grateful he was for everything that had come his way. And there was a wife seated right in front of him who had been waiting for 16 years to hear two words. I'm sorry. Still waiting. And many people say, well, I figure staying sober is making amends. No, it's not. It's staying sober. Making amends is making amends. And one of the big reasons why we don't make them is embarrassment and shame but we do have to climb over the difficult 
I remember a man who was so sorry for what he had done to his family. And he, he came to see me one day at the school where I was teaching. And he said, I've got to talk to you. I said, what's up? He said, my wife is gone. She has left me completely. Her parting words were, I don't ever want to lay eyes on you ever again in my life. Now, he said, that's extremely difficult, but I accept it because I can't not accept it. It's a fact of my life. I only hope to God that one day she might get into Al-Anon and learn something about this disease and what it did to me and what it made out of me and what it made me become and at least have some kind of understanding of how and why I behaved the way I did during the drinking. I knew him as Dr. Jekyll, a wonderful, caring, sweet, really a sweet, kind man. But she had lived for many years with Mr. Hyde. And I didn't know what to say to him, really. Uh, I never hold up false hope to anybody. I think that's a crime. I don't think I'll do that. But I said this, and I said it infallibly, and I'll say it to any of you in this room who, are, who may be in a similar situation. You may never be forgiven. But that's something that you must accept. But I said this to him. Whether or not your wife will ever learn, I don't know. And I'd be a fool to try to say. But I can tell you that if you stay sober today, and you do the same thing tomorrow, and you keep doing that, good things will happen in your life. That is infallibly true. My friends, it was 15 years later, I was in Pittsburgh to speak at a dinner, and this man and his wife came walking up to me arm in arm to say hello. All right, it was one of those things. It was kind of a miraculous thing, really. Obviously, it was. And I'm not saying that that will happen to any of you. But perhaps not being able to make it up may be the price that I have to pay for whatever it is that I did that I'm sorry for. All I need to know is that God Almighty has forgiven me, and if that's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. I'll give you another example that's even more striking. <clears throat> I knew a man who was a professional writer, and he wrote a weekly feature for Look Magazine. The Look headquarters were in New York, and he also wrote a daily feature for the Chicago Tribune. By his own account, this man, Austin Ripley, was an arrogant drunk, and he offended everybody just by breathing. <laughs> and after he got sober, he was so intrigued at the nature of AA and how it worked and what it had done for him, he took a solid year of his life off to get to meet and know Bill and Dr. Bob. And I think that he knew their minds and hearts inside out, as they did his. Well, anyway, he made a list of people he had harmed. It was about a mile and three quarters long. And he resolved to make amends and seek their forgiveness. And he made an all-day appointment to fly to New York to the Look Building. And he had appointments with all of them, from the, uh, the CEO up in the penthouse down to the fellow that opens the front door. And, of course, Rip had the heart of a saint and the tongue of a poet. He really could sell refrigerators to Eskimos. And he went in to each office. He had an appointment all the way down. 
And in that inimitable way of his, he explained alcoholism and what it had done to him and why it had made him behave the way he did and think the way he did. And, and he was receiving all kinds of forgiveness. You will notice. If your sorrow is sincere, you will be stunned at the generosity and the kindness and the forgiveness of people. Some you may be disappointed in. So be it. Anyway, he got down to the office of a vice president who made him wait for 20 minutes. And when he was ushered into the man's office, he was not invited to sit down. And he was asked, what do you want? And Rip told him, I know that I have caused you grief. This is why I am genuinely sorry. I beg your forgiveness. And this was the reply verbatim. Ripley, you were an SOB then, and you are still one. Get the hell out of my office. And he was crushed. He was absolutely crushed. And he was angry. And he walked out of that office, went to the elevator and pressed the button. He wanted to wait for the elevator, go down, get a cab, go to the airport and fly back to Chicago. But while he was waiting for the elevator to come, these thoughts struck him. Haven't you forgotten the forgiveness you've been given? Haven't you forgotten the rest of the people to whom you owe apologies? And then it struck him. That man did not have to accept my apology. I had to give it. And when the elevator came, he hit the next floor and went on with it. The other one was an essay in Newsweek magazine, and this one struck me like a truck. It was written by a young man whose father was an alcoholic who got into AA and had about three years of sobriety. And the father, trying to make amends to his family, called him one day and made an appointment to go over to see him. And he met the boy in the kitchen of his son's house. And he went into quite a, a talk about how sorry he was for the pain and the anguish and everything else that he had caused his family during the drinking days. And he got up and he put his arms around the sun and just sobbing, he said, I am just so sorry. And the next line in that essay, the boy said, that was not enough. Does he think he can wipe out 20 years of physical abuse, making us children watch him beat our mother and then beat us? Oh, no, that was not enough. The feelings that that boy had, perfectly valid, I guess, but the unresolved hatred in his own heart might one day destroy him. I, I have been privileged to meet a lot of POWs in talking around military installations. And I stand in awe of these men. That is, those who coped with prison and resumed their careers when they got out. And I remember speaking to a colonel, a commanding officer at one of our Air Force bases in England. And I said, Colonel, I've been telling people everywhere that the, the, probably the main characteristic or the one that impressed me about POWs is the fact that I've noticed these men don't hate. He said, no, Father, we couldn't. That was a luxury we could not afford. We could not hate. Hatred destroys the hater. Somebody once asked Stockdale, the man that ran with Perot, he was superintendent at our Naval Academy when he got out. And he used to speak at luncheons around. And after luncheon, somebody at, at uh, Kiwanis Club or Alliance or whatever said, Admiral, 
You're walking down a street in Annapolis and suddenly you see one of the North Vietnamese that used to torture you in prison. What would you do? What would be your immediate reaction? He said, I'd say hello. What do you say to anybody that you know? Those men had to work to get there, to get to that stage of thinking and behaving. The feeling of anger is understandable. Giving way to it, no. If you are genuine in your apologies, you have a right to forgiveness. And whoever breaks that right has the problem, not you. And now we come to a phenomenon. It's over here. <laughs> the obligation on our part to forgive others. Alcoholics and drug addicts cause a lot of pain. And very often, I, when talking to the young at Ashley, just one-on-one, -on -one, have, have you ever even wondered of the pain that you caused in the hearts of your mother and father? You'll never know it, really until and unless you have a child of your own who becomes addicted and you watch them on a downward spiral towards self-destruction and you're absolutely incapable of doing anything about it. Only a parent who has experienced that can understand it. And I think that in the world of stealing, one of the most precious and serious things that we steal is time. Not just time from employers, but time from our loved ones. How many who are in the world of addiction shy away from their loved ones. I don't want you to see me. I don't want you to hear me. You're liable to discover what's wrong with me. And so we steal valuable time from them. I believe that alcoholics are also offended by others, even well-meaning others. How about the curses and the screaming and the accusations? You're weak-willed, you have no spine, you can't keep a promise. That hurts in here. And there are those who get into proper therapy and understand that they have to make amends and they come to the alcoholic or drug addict with their sorrow. What is to prompt us to forgive them? Well, I think a basic realization that if I want forgiveness for what I've done wrong, so does every other human being. So does every other human being. Christ himself taught us priests how to hear confessions, and I think he taught the whole world how to forgive. When those who were out to trap him caught a woman in the act of adultery and threw her at his feet and said, what are we going to do with her? The law says she ought to be stoned to death. What do you say? Well, he knew that if he said, well, stone her, I mean, the people would have said, well, come on. And if he had said, no, don't stone her to death, that it said you're breaking the law that you claim came from God, who you claim is your father. Well, he wanted to give him a chance to think it over and get out of there, and he began to scratch around in the sand, and they kept at it. What do you say? And he dropped the stick, and he looked at him, and he said, well, if that's what the law calls for, then stone her. But let me make a suggestion. Let the one who has never done anything wrong in his life begin. Let him throw the first one. Now, the fact that they had to walk away was a foregone conclusion. That's not important. But the order in which they left with the oldest leading the crowd. Now they're gone. There's only the woman and Christ. He never once mentioned what she had done. Didn't even refer to it. Are there none to condemn you? She said, no. Well, he said, neither do I. 
Go and sin no more. Wrapped up in my sorrow is a purpose not to do again the things that made me sorry in the first place. And so he resolved her guilt. When we forgive, we certainly get more than we give. A sense of fulfillment, a sense of being human again. What's a human being? A creature made in the image of God. And if we're in the image of God, we ought to try to act like Him. And the big thing is to forgive. In the official night prayers of the church, there are a choice of many hymns at the beginning. And in one of them is this line. And what needs forgiving at the end of this day, dear Father, now forgive. In my own personal formula of night prayers, every night when I go to bed, I always offer an act of contrition or sorrow for whatever has gone wrong during the day. But if we, I believe that you and I can learn a lesson from the lives of good people we know, and we all know genuinely wonderful, wonderful, good, solid people. And one was my mother. She had a third grade education, but she was consumed with her profession. Motherhood. Totally devoted to her husband and her seven children. She lived an ordinary life and a very difficult life. She had very little to ask of God. She only wanted three things. She wanted to see her children grown and able to take care of themselves or married with somebody to take care of them. She wanted to see me ordained and she wanted to die out of debt, not owing anyone. Since her requests were so simple, they were granted. She died of uremic poisoning. I remember one night I was in Mercy Hospital about three days before her death. I was the only one of the family at that particular time in the room, and I was reading my divine office, and she was in a kind of a coma in the bed, lying on her back. And there was dead silence in the room, and I heard her try to talk. And I closed the book and got up and walked over and leaned my ear over near her mouth, and I heard her whisper, O oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I looked down at my mother's face and realized my mother doesn't know what a real sin is. I believe that the innocence of good people who have such a delicate conscience that they are very aware of even minor flaws in their behavior can perhaps teach us to try to develop such a conscience and our forgiveness will be assured. But the biggest motive of all for forgiving others comes again in AA at the end of every meeting here in the Western world, it is pretty customary to say the Lord's Prayer, and in it is this invocation, a petition. It's a request from God. Forgive me, please, as I forgive. I wonder what would happen to us if he answered that. If he forgave us to the degree that we forgive others. If I ask that, I'd better mean it. But living the good life, I'll never forget, and I'll wind up with this. In the seminary, we used to go to confession every Saturday night. My confessor happened to be Father John Sullivan. And this one Saturday, I, uh, I made my confession, the uncharitable thoughts, sloppy at prayer, on and on. And I said, Father... I don't know whether I'm making any progress or not. I'm confessing these same things week after week. He said, my dear boy, you'll be confessing them when you're 85. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> I mean, there's no growth. 
The essence of living according to the will of God, which we pray for in step 11 of our program. If I succeed in doing good, it's only because of the grace of God. If I fail, it's through my own human weakness. So actual success or failure doesn't mean all that much. My desire to please God is what pleases God. My desire to please Him is what pleases Him. And I feel absolutely certain in the depths of my own soul that those of you in the program who are conscientiously trying to live it are trying to please God and so you do. And forgiveness for anything is yours. I want to thank you for being here this evening. It means a great deal to me when I'm doing one of these things, especially a brand new one like this, is to have the, uh, the presence and the good wishes of friends. So thank you again so much. And good night.